Hello, hello. Hi. I, we are here to talk about the very first challenge of 2023, the WikiTree Challenge. So with me, I have Catherine Hogan from Ontario Ancestors, and we were really super excited to work with her group this week. And she was saying, we were talking before she came on about how she told everybody she wanted to be surprised, but a couple of the comments kind of slipped out where, <laughs> where she saw them. But I think we're still going to surprise her just fine. And then Megan is also going to be joining us here. Oh, she doesn't have a camera on right now. Just Hi, hard. everybody. Hi. Fixed. Hi, Megan. Hello. I am attempting to fix my camera. I'm having a bit of an issue on this end, but I'm working on it. <laughs> but okay. I am here and I put up a picture just in case. <laughs> so. Awesome. And then we have Cheryl Hess and Cheryl was the captain this year. So she got to have the first week where we try out all the new stuff we do <laughs> at yes. the nice. this year. And she did a fantastic job of you know, leading the team and keeping everybody on track and motivated. And, you know, it really was an exciting week. So it was. Um, yeah, it was. I'm going to um, talk just uh, briefly about Wikitree here. And then I'm going to show you some of the discoveries we found. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit more about the research and about how, you know, Catherine and Megan uh, feel about our results and whatnot. So, uh, before we get started, I do want to share a little bit about Wikitree. For those of you that don't know, we are the Free Family Tree. It was founded in 2008 by Chris Witten. Uh, the mission of Wikitree, <clears throat> excuse me, community is to grow one accurate share tree that connects us all and is accessible to all for free forever. So Wikitree provides a collaborative environment for evaluating sources and incorporating DNA and did I mention everything is free? One of our goals is to have one profile per person that has lived for every person that has lived, which is why collaboration is key to our success. So if I have a great grandfather and then you are a descendant off another branch of that same great grandfather, he just has one profile. And that gives us the chance to work together and gain information from each other and hopefully honor that ancestor the best we're able to. I am very excited to say we just passed 33 million profiles and um, almost 11 million of those have DNA connections attached to them. So if you have not tried out Wikitree yet, you need to go to wikitree.com and see what it's all about. And then I'm gonna go ahead and bring this up. Hopefully, um, Megan will find her camera, <laughs> but at least she can listen. Megan, you can see everything fine though, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to put us, let's see, let's do it like that. So you can see now. Oh, that got changed for that one. So excuse me. Let's see, She made those changes. Here's Margaret Atwood's profile that we shared before. You can see there's a section on profiles for a biography. There's also a section for sources. As you can see, this is Tom Longboat's profile here. And accuracy and sources are a key part of the Wikitree community, as we mentioned, um, you know, with our honor code. Another aspect of Wikitree is to balance between privacy and collaboration. So we want to connect everybody, but we also want to um, protect the privacy of those close family members that we can and for living people. And then, you know, as you go further back on your tree, the privacy controls are going to open up. So collaboration on deep ancestors is between distant cousins who are serious about genealogical research, research, careful about sources and willing to see their research validated or invalidated with DNA. And as you can see here, there are seven different privacy options that are available for profiles. So living individuals can be unlisted and not appear in searches or um, in search results. While profiles of anybody born over 150 years ago are viewable to anybody that signed the honor code. And, you know, once again, we all work together on these profiles. So you may not be the only one that works on that, an that ancestor. 
uh, once again, if you aren't a member yet, we invite you to come on over and join our dynamic community. Try it out. It's free. All you have to do is go to wikitree.com and create an account. And now for the challenge part of it, we partner with Ontario Ancestors, and this is Canada's largest member-supported genealogical organization. And, you know, we're just so excited to be um, joining up with these groups that really have the same passions that we do. You know, we want to make sure that these ancestors are honored and um, respected and, you know, and our, our heritage and no matter where we come from is, you know, protected and documented and um, there for the future generations to see. Now, Catherine, I'm going to let you talk a little bit here, though, about why you chose the people that you did. We started out with seven starting people. We had seven days to work on them. But I know you had some kind of specific reasons about why you chose the seven. Okay. Um, so in collaboration with Megan, um, these are the seven people we chose. Now, Megan and I also work on a committee um, within Ontario Genealogical Society, and that is what we call the IDEA team, and that's Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility team. And um, we're, we're in the midst of doing some planning and things like that. And so we wanted to make sure that the seven people that we chose to be researched um, are across the diaspora of the population of Ontario. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't choosing just British people, English people, Scottish um, from Great Britain, because even though a lot of our population is um, of that background, there's a lot of other people too from all over the world that have come to Ontario. So the seven people um, I chose, I hopefully did uh, enough of, um, I guess, um, diversity and enough of um, a selection of people to give the researchers a good challenge. So I don't have the list in front of me, but I'm hoping I can remember off the top of my head. And if I miss somebody, Mindy, hopefully you can help me or Cheryl, you can help me. Um, so we chose um, Alton C. Parker. Now I chose Alton C. Parker because I know a little bit about him. Um, he's from the city where I live, which is Windsor, Ontario. And he is a he's a fairly big name in our community here in Windsor, Essex. And he is famous because he is the first black Canadian um, who was a detective. Um, the second person I chose was Beatrice Tillman. And she is um, well known in the black community in Gray County. Um, Oh, I'm trying to get the, I don't have the list in front of me. Can you help me out here? That's Mindy? okay. Yeah. You don't have to list them all off. Um, okay. I just thought you might want to do just generally why you picked them. Okay. So um, we chose, we chose um, black Canadians. We chose somebody who was from the first nations. We chose somebody from the Asian community. And I remember him, Sam Ching, and he was the first Asian to arrive, uh, to arrive in Toronto. Um, and then we chose, I can't remember if it was one or two people from the Jewish community. Um, Fanny. Yeah, Fanny, Fanny anyway, Rosenfeld. Mm -hmm, and she, Fanny Rosenfeld. Um, she was an Olympic athlete. And, um, and then we did, and I, I did, and I did choose somebody that I thought, I thought would be easy. And we'll find out if he was easy to research or not. Um, and he was a bank robber. Yes. Because I thought, you know what, mm -hmm. let's throw somebody, let's throw somebody really fun into the mix. And, you know, criminals are always interesting, of course, to research. And I've never heard of this guy before. And he was a bank robber in the Toronto area in the 1940s and the 1950s. So that was kind of our mix of people. And then I just handed it all you know, the list off to Mindy and let the researchers have at it. And that we did. And, you know, yes, and we do appreciate you adding, um, you know, what you call fun. We think they're all fun, but yes, yes, it was a lot of fun with Boyd and it drew some people in, you know, wanting to see more about his life, you know, and the, and the odd thing is, is you start reading about this stuff and, you know, we always look to put things in historical context. And, you know, kind of look at what's going on with their whole life overall. And you kind of feel bad for him at the start of it, you know, when his criminal career first started. So 
um, we'll look a little bit more at him. I know you know who the seven starting people are, but some of our viewers don't know. So we're going to touch on those, plus talk about uh, some of the new ones that we have. So the one that you were saying, one of the ones um, you started with was Beatrice Tillman. And yeah, she was just a really fascinating lady. Now, she was the third youngest of 12 children in a very close-knit family. Her father died when she was 11, which, you know, kind of forced her to have to go work to help support the family. She diligently worked to preserve and demonstrate the history, ingenuity, and the resilience of the local Black community. And much of the Grey Roots Black History collection exists because of her tireless efforts to ensure that everybody knows the contribution of the Black community in Grey County. And, you know, so I'm sure she was missed uh, by many when she was gone and her, you know, legacy lives on. Now, one of the people off in her branches was Turner Lee Tillman. He was the husband of Beatrice. His father rented a farm, which he worked. So, you know, a nice, quiet um, upbringing. He worked for the New York Central Railroad's commissary, and then he died in front of City Hall at the age of 78, so I'm not sure what what he was doing in um, front of City Hall, but I guess he, he wanted to go out with a bang, uh, really memorable. But one of the things that we found really interesting, you know, and these are those details that really help kind of bring somebody to life, is that he was a Mason. He was a Mason for 48 years. And for 30 years of that, he was a 33rd degree Mason. So, um, you know, that's like an incredible amount of commitment to that community and to those people. And I just found that really fascinating. He had done that for so long. Next, we have Raspberry Hovell. And he was born in 1793 in Denver, England. I like the name to begin with. <laughs> That's a fun name. You know, he gets to be Raspberry. And he was a first cousin to Thomas Hubble. So in 1815, he was in prison for larceny. In 1821, he was accused of larceny and found not guilty. And then again in 1822, he was accused of larceny and found not guilty. And sometimes these are... You know, the only ways we see a lot about these ancestors is either they're really notable, um, you know, wealthier politicians, or they kind of get into trouble a lot and you find all these notices. And um, he was in, Raspberry was in that second column. Now, in 1828, he got together with his brother, William, and they were found guilty of robbery. So John Boyd doesn't get to crowd the whole um, stage for, for the robbery, robbery thing. And in 1834, he was granted a certificate of freedom. So he was freed. Now, the brother William was charged with breaking into a Mr. Pike shop. And they found part of the goods hidden in a haystack of all things and the rest of the stuff in his house. So it kind of makes you wonder if somebody didn't, you know, kind of tell on him because otherwise who would go search this haystack, <laughs> you know, and, and find that stuff. But at any rate, the only thing that Raspberry had kept out of the deal was a watch. And so there was a third man that was also taken into custody. He was charged. But Raspberry was sentenced to seven years for which he was transported to New South Wales to serve. And, you know, this comes up from time to time where, um, you know, countries have these these areas where they ship their convicts off to hoping, you know, they'll get them out of the general public and whatnot. But seven years seems a little stiff for a watch. So it kind of makes you wonder if it wasn't, you know, par partially because of his past history, whether he had been convicted or not. He seemed to have been known for thievery. So and, you know, he had to have been wondering later if it was really worth it, he, you know, thinking, man, if I just would have not kept that watch. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Now, we also have uh, Alan Parker, Alton Parker, sorry. He was one of the, the notables nominated. And he was born in 1907 in Windsor, Ontario. He worked as a mechanic as a young adult. And then he moved to being a foreman at a used car dealership. Now, during that time, he was the president of the Central Citizens Association, which helped Black people gain employment in public service jobs. In 1942, he was hired as a constable in the Windsor Police Service. And like you said, he became the first black detective in Canada. So definitely, you know, an admirable person. And he really did some great things for his community. And I can see why he was nominated as one of the seven. 
And, you know, instead of just going out, out further onto the branches, we also look sideways and we look down. So, you know, one of the things we looked at was Frida and Frida Steele, who was Frida Tillman, um, was one of Alton's daughters. And she attended nursing school at a time when Black Canadian women were barred from doing so. And she actually was the third Black Canadian woman to officially graduate. So, um, you know, she was later the director of patient registration. So basically, she was not going to be outdone by what her dad did. And following in his, you know, admirable example, she attended that nursing school when she wasn't even supposed to be attending it. And it wasn't until a discrimination case was filed in 1948 that that ban was lifted. And so there were two other women that graduated right before her. And um, within several months, Frida graduated being that third uh, Black Canadian woman to officially graduate. And when she died, it was said that she was raised in a home where she was taught to love God and reach out to others in her community. Uh, you know, she led a life as a nurturer. She worked in the hospital um, in some capacity or another until 1992. She volunteered in many, many activities to carry on, you know, her devout beliefs and her commitment to the community. And historian Irene Morris Davis said, when an elder dies, it's like a library burning to the ground. And we know that one of our mightiest trees has fallen. And, you know, I think that's just um, an incredible statement that goes uh, towards showing how much uh, Frida valued everyone and how much respect they had for her. Now, this, of course, was another great one. And this was one of the Curb Lake First Nation people, Elsie, Elsie Mae Taylor Knott. And she worked to support a family also when she was newly married. Uh, but it was because her husband, Cecil, was battling tuberculosis. And so she became the first woman in Canada to be elected as a chief of the First Nation. She was only 33 years old at the time. She would go on to hold this position for 16 years. She also held the position of Senator of the Union of Ontario Indians in 1976. And she was a fierce supporter of her native language, Ojibwe. So, you know, that was really great. Now, she was the child of her father and his second wife, Esther. Daniel Wedung was related to his first wife, Harriet. Now, Daniel was born in 1878. He served as a chief of the Curve Lake First Nation. He was a member of the Mississauga Nation. He was part of several negotiations with the provincial and federal governments. And, you know, he died in 1948 and was mentioned on a memorial in Curve Lake Cemetery. And um, so just really interesting, really interesting people on her line. We have another one here. Elijah Marsden was also Canadian First Peoples and a member of the Mississauga Nation. He was born uh, in 1881 in Ontario to William Marsden and Sarah Goose Marsden. And like his father, he was a farmer and he attended a Methodist church. His father later uh, became a school teacher. And Elijah took up basket making and his oc occupation working for himself. And, you know, he suffered a particularly tragic death after being swept up one day by a heavy wind. The wind actually caught the baskets that he had. Uh, up on his shoulder and they flung him into a radial car and so the injuries from this incident were fatal within hours mm -hmm. and you know it's just crazy to imagine that such a freak accident like that um could happen oh that's terrible right now, to go a little more on the fun side, I think people were ready to um adopt Mrs. Susan Howard as grandma. <laughs> but she was also a, a First Peoples, and she was from Alderville, Hiawatha. And it says while walking along the track of the old railroad, she saw a bear emerge from a hole. So she happened to have an ax on her, and she killed the bear. Well, in a moment, another bear appeared, and she promptly dispatched of that one. Still another, a third bear came out. She killed that one with her trusty ax. So three grown bears killed by a woman after their winter sleep. I guess they were coming out of hibernation, so a little bit slow. The animals were skinned and the meat cut into strips and dried for summer meat. Uh, she was Elsie's 
grand aunt. Oh wow. my goodness. Well, I've just adopted her also because that's an incredible <laughs> story. Oh my right? goodness. Can oh, you imagine amazing. though? You're like, oh, I can't believe I just killed a bear. <laughs> oh, here comes another one. <laughs> and, and like three more, you know, no big deal. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And you don't usually, yeah. And the hibernation kind of explains it because you don't usually see them grouped like that. You know, you might see like a mama bear and a baby bear, but otherwise the adults are usually kind of wandering out on their own. They're not, yeah. um, they're, they, they don't go out on, on, uh, hiking parties. So. And just what a woman. meat and skins that came back to the, to her community is just, oh, incredible. Right. Yeah. Wow. Best Strong men people. left her alone. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't make Susan mad, anybody. <laughs> don't do it. Okay, and now here we have Sam, Sam Ching. And I know, you know, uh, we were talking with Catherine before we started about she's been trying so hard to stay away from everything and not hear anything that's going on. But somebody did post something about Sam that she saw um, uh, probably out on social media. And then there was another incident um, that came up that somebody put into the general chat, not realizing we were trying to hide everything from Catherine. But I think Catherine's still going to be surprised. So, uh, you know, we definitely do not have parents for Sam. He was the four fourth person on the list and definitely the most difficult to research. Now, he migrated, it says from China to Ontario, but there are beliefs that he went through the United States before he mm -hmm. reached Ontario. He was the first documented businessman and resident of Chinese origin in Toronto. He owned the Sam Ching and Company Chinese Laundry on Adelaide Street East, close to the railroad. And an alternate name actually was found near the end um, for him as Chang Sen. So it's kind of said son, I think, closer to son if you listen to somebody say it out loud instead of Sam. But we had, uh, Alan Boyce was one of the researchers that spent a lot of time focusing on Sam and, you know, his research was greatly appreciated. Yes. <clears throat> and, you know, we wound up with Catherine, though, we had more than 10 people that worked on Sam's profile, which is incredible mm -hmm. to watch, you know, the collaboration and the communication mm -hmm. that goes when you get that many people focusing on it. And they were looking at everything down to, I mean, they had the addresses memorized where he was on this census. And, you know, they were looking at every tiny detail, trying to get clues. Um, and, you know, and they say that by 1891, there were 33 men of Chinese origin and very few occupations were allowed. Now, this was interesting. And I know a lot of us did some extra reading, you know, because we did have Sam on the list. But... Um, once again, they said his ties to the United States, where he might have migrated from there, you know, China to the United States, then here with his friends, which definitely came from the United States before they went to Toronto, um, were because he immediately opened that laundry shop. Now, you know, one of the things that was said in the material that we read is that there were no such shops in China because the men did not do laundry. <laughs> So not here where, you know, some of the men don't do laundry or don't like to. There the men absolutely did not do laundry. That was a female's job. And one of the things I found fascinating is, you know, a lot of these uh, people from China migrated because of the gold rush. And so these men would come with their however many sets of clothes and they would wear a set of clothes until it was like literally falling off of them. Or, you know, if they did have the money, um, a little bit of money for it, they would actually mail their clothes back to their wife in China. <laughs> and they would wait, which would take months for it to come back to them. She would wash the clothes and put them back in the mail. And they would just have to wear what they had until the clothes returned, which, you know, I mean, to nowadays to us just seems shocking because... Um, you know, I know if my husband's clothes got dirty, he would just throw them in the wash. But, you know, it also was a, um, not as easy as we have it now. You didn't throw it in the washing machine, you know, and those people that worked in the laundry shops worked really hard. I mean, it was physical labor and they, they worked 12, 14 hour days and it was all hand washing of that laundry. And so, um, yeah, they think, you know, because he had the skills when he showed up in Toronto, he most likely learned them in the United States. And, you know, we know there's at least four of them 
that showed up at about the same time. And, you know, so they may have all landed in the same place in the United States before they made it to um, Toronto. <clears throat> and there is a ton, ton, ton of research you'll see on his profile. And I know you'll want to look once we get done with all of this. And, you know, so we did not find any definite migration records. And, you know, the premise that he went through the United States first could explain why. Because if you do look for that name going through the United States, um, there are more than one. So, you know, still wasn't something we could narrow down and find anything definitive. And, you know, we also took a look at his friends, such as Ah Lung. And that was another thing we learned. You know, not only did were the names often mistaken by people that were Canadian or American, because they don't say the Chinese don't say their first name first. They say their last name first. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we would hear their name and we would write it down and we'd have it backwards. And, you know, one of the other things that um, that we did uh, not understanding was that ah, so A-H is often a term of respect and affection or sometimes just means that person. And so, you know, for like his friend who was all lung in all the records really was just like saying, buddy lung, <laughs> you know, my friend lung, um, his name was not awe at all. There, there isn't a name that's awe. Mm -hmm. It's just a term. And so, yeah. And so because, you know, they recorded them that way, they probably just, he probably just went, oh, well, that's, you know, what it's going to be. And he stayed that way in records. Um, you know, that's what his name remained as he stayed in Canada. But now we know that we don't know what his full name was because it definitely was not Ah. Uh, his first name was not Ah. Uh. So that was just really super interesting. Now, Chi Hang, they said, probably came from Guangdong in Canton. And mm -hmm. he was po possibly in the Taishan area within Guangdong. So A Lung Imp came from Hong Kong and possibly um, the additional friend. And so we also had Wa Li, who most likely came from Guangdong as well. And so, you know, we're, they're not all, all four of the men weren't necessarily from the same area. But once again, there's a good chance they met up in the United States and they all went to Toronto together. And, you know, I don't know if those two that uh, were from Guangdong uh, knew each other before they moved or not. You know, and with any any new population like this, and, and you have things, especially in our history, like the, um, the gold rush. And, you know, you always come across this where people are afraid of things that they don't understand or things that are new. And so it's really, really just heartbreaking to read about the open hostility and whatnot they had against these men that just came to, you know, they just wanted to earn an mm -hmm. honest living and support their families and make something of themselves. And, you know, they worked really hard, um, you know, really long hours. Uh, they worked six days a week, the ones that did the laundry. And there were several of them that did. And um, yeah, you know, nowadays that doesn't happen like that. But back then it just was a sign of the times. But, you know, you, you don't think about it really specifically until you get into all the reading about this. And, you know, we even had to put warning on some of the articles. We were like, well, this, this was a good article, but please just, you know, ignore that somebody um, mm. didn't realize at that time that those words were offensive. And, you know, it, uh, for anybody sensitive, just don't read it. Now, here was the one that you were talking about was Jewish. And I had hopes that Fanny uh, Roosevelt, that we would get a lot done on because we have handled uh, a lot of Jewish people within the challenge now. And, you know, we've done a lot of Ukraine research and she was uh, born in Dipro, Ukraine. She was named Canada's female athlete of the half century in 1950. She was inducted into the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame in 1949, the Canada Sports Hall of Fame in 1955, and the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame in 1996. So not an overachiever at all. Um, really fantastically gifted athlete. Now, her father was a junk dealer. Her mother didn't work. 
Uh, she early on worked in a chocolate factory. And this was interesting. She entered the uh, sport after entering a hundred yard dash at a picnic on the dare of a friend, a friend said, I dare you. And she was like, okay, I take that dare. And that's actually how she got into the sport and found out that she was incredibly gifted at it. So, you know, within two years, she broke records and she shared the world record at one point for the 100 yard dash at 11 seconds with Rosa Gross. Uh, she beat Rosa on two other occasions though. Now, and she went by Bobby instead of Fanny. Bobby continued to compete and was in the Summer Olympics in Amsterdam in 1928. She contracted severe arthritis later, which ended her career and led her to coaching. And then she eventually became a sports journalist. Now, we looked for records that pertain to her from Dipro, and we just didn't find anything. And once again, I was really, um, you know, disappointed because we were really hoping to be able to uh, get something definitive on her. And if so, her lines would have taken off. You know, we have some really great researchers for that area. But unfortunately, they just weren't having any luck with that. Mm. And then because we're talking about sports, I want to mention somebody that was on one of the other lines. So on the Taylor line, we had Albert Sylvester Smoke, and he was born 1894. Now, he was a Canadian long distance runner, and he was only four feet, 10 inches tall. That's it. And he was a long distance runner. He competed in the marathon at the 1920 Summer Olympics, and he was actually considered one of the best of his era. So... Uh, you know, there's some fast uh, genetics in those family lines, <laughs> very definitely. Now, here we have Edwin Alonzo John Boyd, and, you know, this is who we were talking about. He was a fascinating mm -hmm. person, and, you know, he got more news time because he, he definitely did get into some trouble. He was born in Toronto just four months before World War I broke out. His father was an electrician. His mother took care of the home. She contracted scarlet fever after two of his siblings had gotten it. And she actually succumbed to it when he was only 15 years old. So, you know, he was at that uh, crucial age going, trying to go, you know, out of the teenage years into adulthood. And um, it just did not sit well with him. Now, by the time he was 22, he was arrested for robbing a gas station. Mm. Then as an adult, he took on a job as a window cleaner and, you know, he was staying out of trouble again. Two years into World War II, an air raid siren went off and the bombing that caught that followed caused the death of his child. And so, um, you know, that had to have added further tragedy to his life and trauma. And he still continued on with his quiet life until about 1949. And I'm not sure what happened that year, but it all went downhill after that. And, you know, that was when he committed his first bank robbery. He was drunk and disguised. He robbed a branch of the Bank of Montreal in Toronto. And, you know, and then after that, just continued on in this life of thievery. He escaped several times from small jails. In 1952, he received eight life sentences for his deeds. He had just gotten into trouble way too many times. But then they turned around in 1966 and released him on parole. So, you know, he took on an assumed identity at that time. He drove a bus for disabled person, uh, persons, and he remarried and he devoted himself to the care of his disabled wife, Marjorie, whom he had met on the bus. And, you know, his life of crime had come to an end. So, you know, once again, he had that spur where he got just really, once he turned into the dark side, it looks like he had a hard time getting out of it. But I think, you know, the tragedies that he had in his life most likely uh, had a lot to do with his acting out. Mm -hmm. It's so important to learn those things about their history. You know, like you hear the end result, but you don't hear about all of those stories that come before it. So interesting. Yeah. And, you know, and they really form who the people are. And, you know, that's why you really want to look at what their environment was. And, you know, I know on WikiTree, we try and bring them, bring them back to life by, you know, showing kind of what they were dealing with at that time. Because, yeah, it's one thing to read an article and go, oh, he was arrested, you know, four times for robbing. Yeah, ha ha. 
um, you know, but you read about all the tragedy in his life and you're like, wow, I mean, that, um, you know, really profound. And that he was so young, you know, when everything kicked off. Mm -hmm. Now, here we had just a little bit more sadness. And these were Jesse and Jay Makara. They were born in 1901 in Perth, Scotland. It was fun researching just all over, though. Um, they were twin daughters of William Makara and Martha Horsfall. Within a year of their birth, their family migrated to Gateshead, England. Both died within the third quarter of 1902. Mm -hmm. And they were second cousins of John Boyd. And, you know, that didn't say the cause of death. So I don't know if there, you know, could have been some type of a flu going through or what. But um, so tragic to that family to go and make that big move and be excited and be in a new country and then lose both of the twins. And, you know, here you can see that relationship between the twins and John Boyd, their maternal grandmothers were sisters. And so these are just a few of the WikiTree family tree widgets that people can use on other websites to display updated information. And it'll update itself from what you do with your tree, you know, but just um, fun to look at the cousins too. And, you know, I always say that I, just like with us in modern times, you know, we have aunts and uncles and cousins that kind of affect sometimes how we look at the world or the things we know. Uh, you know, it's not your parents only that teach you everything. And, you know, hopefully you grow up around family. And so I like to be able to see, you know, what kind of things were going on within these uh, other branches of the families. And then, unfortunately, the Makaras, though, had their fair share of tragic young deaths. Now, these weren't as young, but we have Ronald and James here, born in Gateshead, England, to William Horsfall Makara and Gertrude Illingsworth Makara. Ronald was a rifleman in the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, 1st Battalion. He died in 1945 at the age of 26. Mm. He was buried in the Grosbeek Canadian War Cemetery in Netherlands. That year marks the end of World War II. So he almost made it through the war. And then James was a flying officer in the 404 Maritime Reconnaissance uh, Squadron. He enlisted in 1951 when the Canadian forces were joining in the Korean War. So mm -hmm. James died in 1952 at the age of 20, and he was laid to rest in the Prospect Cemetery in Ontario. And they were both the grandsons of William Makara, who was the father of the Makara twins. And so, you know, definitely some tragedy in those lines and um, hardships. Now, here was another one that was nominated, and this is Barbara Hanley. She was born in 1882 in Ryerson, Ontario. She was the daughter of Henry Smith and Catherine Mitchell Smith. And they were both carpenters by trade, which was interesting. Um, not a occupation you generally see for women uh, during that time. And Barbara had trained as a teacher. And by the age of 19, she was already employed as such in Burke's Fall. Now, she organized the Webwood Dramatic Society, staging plays, musicals, and variety shows for the town. She was elected to the Webwood Public School Board in 1923, and she held that position for 12 years. She was re-elected mayor seven times, serving eight terms in total. Her politics focused on improving the community and providing for relief. Besides being mayor, she also served on her local ration committee during the Second World War. She died in 1959 at the age of 76. Her husband, Joseph, died two years later. So definitely, I can see, Catherine, why you guys nominated this one, too. I mean, that woman is just incredible. Now, here we have uh, Jean Pigo, and she was born in 1924 in Ottawa, Canada. She worked at her father's bakery after a year of college. She married the assistant that she had hired, which was an accountant named Arthur Pigo. They cut the cake at their wedding with a knife given to her father by King George VI. That's yeah. really cool. Oh, that's a story. <laughs> right. There you go. And yeah, I wouldn't let anybody else touch it except for the wedding. Okay, put it back up now. <laughs> <laughs> 
put it back up. It's got, yeah, it had it had the king's fingerprints on it. Um, she became a member of parliament with the Progressive Conservative Party in 1976. And in 1984, she was appointed chairwoman of the National Capital Commission by um, Prime Minister Brian uh, Mulroney. And then, as you can see here, Jean is related to Barbara via her husband's family and Barbara's sister-in-law. So, you know, related by marriage, but still in the sphere of each other's world, not that far apart. And the women in Jean's family were equally as committed to helping their communities. So, you know, where Jean was the first woman uh, chair, chairperson of Ontario Hydro, she received the Order of Canada in 1995. Mm -hmm. Her sister Marguerite Ann Morrison Hale also received the Order of Canada in 2006. <laughs> She was the governor of the University of Ottawa, president of the Beechwood National Cemetery, and honorary colonel of the Governor General's Foot Guards, the first woman to ever do so. Yeah. They had a third sister who I don't have the name of um, that was equally incredible. And they called them Ottawa's uh, legendary, the Three Sisters. So, oh, my God. I had no idea about no this. Idea. That's incredible. Yeah, it was really great. I just love all the stuff everybody finds. These researchers always, you know, our wiki treers do such a great job. And I try and participate when I can. But there's some of them that just plug away at this all week. And, you know, they just really dig in there and help bring these people back. And, you know, they made a lot of connections uh, while they were doing so. They found a lot of these little stories. And, you know, just always amazes me. Really impressive work. And then, you know, one of the things, too, I found interesting is, you know, they were saying that Marguerite was known for doing all of those things that she did. She also oversaw the production of the Centennial Cake. Now, this cake stood 20 feet tall. It was covered in 700 pounds of icing. <laughs> and it fed the 40,000 Canadians who came to Parliament Hill for the country's birthday bath. <laughs> That, oh, is wow. most, that is the most Canadian thing I've ever heard in my life. That's right. <laughs> Everybody who shows up. Biggest thing ever. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yeah. <clears throat> who else would you ask to oversee something like that? But somebody like that, you know, they're like, they can, oh, we can do anything. Just tell me what it is. You know, we can do it. Now, here we had another set of twins. And... Uh, John and Lewis Landon, they were twins born in 1853 in Fitzroy. They were sons of a farmer. Now, John married in 1873. Lewis married in 1878. They lived in Abernethy, Saskatchewan in 1921. Lewis saved a child's life in 1888 when a huge prairie fire arose. Hmm. And, you know, he actually risked his own life to go get yeah. his child out. And he yeah. was badly burned during the rescue. And, you know, amazingly enough, both men died in 1938 in Regina, Saskatchewan. You know, when they talk about the bond between, you know, say couples that have been married for 50, 60 years, how a lot of times they'll pass together. Um, you know, these men, it's not like they were young and it was an accident. They died. They both died in 1938 in Regina. And so it just really, um, you know, emphasizes that strong bond that those brothers had to have had. Now, here was another interesting one. We have George Souch, who was born in 1916 in York. His father was a telegraph operator in Toronto. He joined the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was flying in Tunisia as an officer bomb aimer when he was killed during operations in 1943. So he had been awarded this Distinguished Flying Cross. He was only 26 years old and had never married. Shame. Yeah, and those are always so sad. And, you know, here we had some other military members. There was a lot more than this. We always try and, you know, we list these on the space page. And, and Catherine, I'll give you the link to that, um, you know, if you don't have it already. Because that is one thing we try and do is make sure these are listed. And these are just some of the ones that were in the military 
we have Sergeant Edwin Glover Boyd, who was 9th Canadian uh, Forces Artillery in World, World War I. We have Private Alfred Coppaway, who was 93rd Battalion, 57th Regiment. John Robert Gordon McCallum, who was the uncle of John Boyd in World War I, Royal Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, John William Harding was a gunner in Canadian Field Artillery. He died in 1916 in France. And actually, we had Mary Baird, who during World War II served as a Wren, W-R-E-N, in the Canadian Naval mm -hmm. uh, Navy, which was the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. So, you know, that was just really cool that we were able to add a female during that time. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's amazing. And just to see how, like just the diversity of stories is just incredible. I'm like kind of speechless here. The diversity <laughs> of stories is really incredible, even within the same family. Yeah, there's there's just so many. And, and you know, we can only like fit so many into this time I slot. But <laughs> I, yeah, I know. And it's like, what do I pick though? Who do I pick out of this? Because they did just find so many incredible people. Uh, you know, and here on Wikitree, we're showing we're all cousins by blood or marriage. And, you know, right now, well, when this started being put together, we were at 28,146,480 people, um, you know, connected. And <clears throat> one of the things that is a great feature on Wikitree is our connection finder. And so once you're connected to the global tree, as we call it, you can mm -hmm. see how you're connected to anybody else that is out there in that global tree also. And so, you know, you can go to George Washington and say, what is he, you know, to me? And it will show you the relationship, whether it is by blood or marriage and how far away. And so, you know, one of the things that we did is we checked our seven individuals to see which of the other seven they were the closest to. Okay. And it turns out that out of the four, the closest connection, um, four of the seven, sorry, have the closest connection with Barbara so um, oh, that was interesting. interesting. So Elsie is 17 degrees from Barbara. Edwin is 19. Beatrice is 20. And Fanny is 24 degrees. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And these are the four charts. And it, that's just what you can see is it'll walk you along that path and show you who all the people are in between them. And here, once again, 17 degrees apart, Elsie and Barbara were the closest connection of any of our seven individuals. And we did kind of wonder if they would wind up um, any bloodlines, direct bloodlines overlapping, but we did not, uh, we okay. did not have that. Mm. And so um, that was something that we looked for, though. And here we have Edwin and Elsie connect through his mother and Eleanor okay. Boyd on her side of the family. And that shows the connection 19 degrees from LC knot. So it swaps uh, over where you see the color changes from yellow to green and then back to yellow. That's where a marriage occurred. Okay. And uh, okay. so <clears throat> I don't know why this one is stuck. We also checked the relationship and connection finders to see who of the seven might be related to the Canadian prime ministers. So there is one with the closest relationship was with Prime Minister Trudeau, and they are 15th cousins, and that would be Elsie. So Elsie and Justin Trudeau are actually 15th cousins uh, related by blood, and wow. their, yeah, their common ancestor is Helen Douglas Ogilvy, who was born about 1435 in Scotland, wow. and she was the daughter of William Douglas, second Earl of Angus. Um, there were a couple others who had some closer connections with other prime ministers. Cool. So we have Beatrice Tillman was 16 degrees from Charles Tupper, who yeah. is, of course, the seventh prime minister of Canada. Um, Alton Parker and Robert Laird Borden. We have uh, are 19 degrees apart. And then we have Barbara Hanley, who's 17 degrees from the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau. And, you know, while we were doing those countries, we researched were Canada, China, England, Ireland, Russian Empire, Scotland, Ukraine, and the United States. 
So cool. it's really fun that we were, you know, you guys gave us a lot of diversity and we were really able to branch out. And for anybody that's watching with questions about this, um, you'll be able to go to wikitree.com for any questions. And, you know, just while the credit's playing, before I go ahead and let uh, Megan and Catherine get some talk time too, and Cheryl in here, I do want to, to thank all of the incredible Wikitreeers that help with this research. They found just an incredible amount of discoveries and it really a fun uh, group to work with. And so, um, you know, that was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm so, incredible. <laughs> the amount of detail. Did we surprise you like after that. all? You did. You did. With the amount of detail, some of the stories um, and things that you found on some of the extended um, lines of the families were really incredible. Um, so, like, thank you. Yeah, thanks to all the research, the hard work they did um, and finding all that detail. So now what I'm going to be doing as soon as we're done here, I'm hopping on over to WikiTree and I'm going to be looking at, oh, I want to look at the profiles. Like I want to go back and look at the profiles of those seven individuals. Yeah. Because what I did when I chose those seven individuals is I actually went to WikiTree to see if they even had a profile to begin with. And I know some of them did and some of them didn't. And the ones that did, there still wasn't even very much information on Wikitree about them when we began this challenge. And just even the ones that you were showing, Mindy, um, the profiles of, of you know, a couple of the people you were showing, I could just see how much more information was added to that person's profile. Um, you know, all the information about siblings and children and mm -hmm. things like that, um, that were found for these individuals. It's, it's really incredible. So thank I think you. you're going to be very surprised, Catherine. I think so, too. I think so, too. I can go back now and look at all the stories, <laughs> you know, that people were alluding to <laughs> um, and get the details um, about them, you know, because um, just for people who don't know, um, to, there's a channel on Discord uh, for the current challenge. And so I had to stay, I, I was really good. I did not peek. I did not go on the current uh, <laughs> challenge channel on Discord to look and see what was going on. And um, so I wanted to be surprised. And I was, I was very much surprised. And I know I, it's a big kudos to the people who volunteer their time on WikiTree and how much love and passion they have for family history. And, you know, they really, you know, delve into the, um, the details and, you know, just some of the other challenges that I've participated in, I can see people and the collaboration mm -hmm. and the time they spend. And, you know, I would say if, if you ever get stuck on a brick wall, and, you, and you've, you know you've run out of options i'd say post it on WikiTree and see what happens because the people out there are amazing absolutely mm -hmm. amazing so yeah. thank you so My just one more thing mindy you have to explain the train <laughs> oh and you know and this is not um yeah catherine was wondering why somebody made a one of you researchers weren't supposed to comment in general chat and you did <laughs> you were supposed to keep it in current challenge but you didn't know that so that's okay i still love you um you know and not to make light of anybody's tragic tragedy certainly but i have to say that i never in my life would have guessed there were so many deaths to trains um, you know, in the mid 19th century that there were, I just never would have guessed. And that's one thing that we've consistently found with the challenge is, you know, we had times where we went months and every challenge week, we found somebody that died from a train that was hit by a train. Um, oh. Every challenge week we had somebody and, you know, and so then the one week we didn't, we'd all be, it's like, you're waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, you're like, okay, who found the train story now? Cause uh, somebody, I in, one go by. somebody in chat you pops know. in with one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be, you know, John Smith over off this line. Yeah, he was hit by a train because this happened. And I just a crazy amount of, you know, and that's another thing, of course, that's why there are safety rules and whatnot that there are nowadays, um, you know, even for any of the railroad tracks, let alone at a train station, you know, so that those things don't happen. But just really amazing the amount of people we found. And uh, yeah, we find one almost every time. 
So um, yeah, somebody was making a comment the other day that, that that was so 2022. So we need to find some better news to focus on for this mm -hmm. year and <laughs> hopefully not continue to find horrible, tragic, you know, train deaths. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. And we did find one this week. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, unfortunately we did. Hmm. The uh, I'm excited. I think one of the first things I'm going to go do is figure out where Sam's shop was on Adelaide so I can well, go down and visit because I would love um, to see what it looks like now. So, yeah, and I was going to say, Catherine, Catherine, and Megan, either of you that are looking at it, you'll want to go get a snack first and then sit at your computer and get ready to read the notes on Sam because what you don't find are new parents. But mm -hmm. what you will find is that we are very vocal with our research notes and um, putting down negative evidence. And there is a ton of information there. You know, once again, we only have seven days to work on this. And so, yeah. um, you know, you could only do so much in seven days. But there's all kinds of hints for future researchers. And I know there's a few that just didn't want to give it up. So they've continued to add things or post in <laughs> message boards you know, about Sam and there's just an incredible amount of research posted on his profile. So um, you'll definitely want to take a look at that. Cool. Good stuff. Lots of good stuff. Lots of good totally. stuff to follow up on. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, and it's yeah. funny because I looked it up. I looked it up because, you know, when, when you're saying the first uh, person of Chinese, uh, Chinese origin in Toronto. So I went and I looked it up and according to the 2021 census, there's now almost 700,000 Chinese, uh, Chinese <laughs> people of Chinese origin in Toronto. So gosh, yeah. that's hugely, imagine being the only one or, or among such a small group. Yeah. Yeah. What, what life yeah and I know they said like? it was like four men that were there. Yeah, the the four that came in initially, and I can't even imagine, uh, you know, going into a new country and, you know, everybody dresses different and talks different and, you know, just really incredibly brave of them to even venture out like that. And they weren't treated very well. No. By the other they people. Not. They were not. No, that I did know. I know a little bit about the history of um, the Chinese Asian population in Canada and the treatment that they received, and it was horrible. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason I think that they opened a laundry was going to be uh, was a pure necessity because we had um, the Chinese had tax in Canada, which really limited the Chinese population coming into Canada. So there was quotas put on them. They had to pay the head tax to come into Canada, and women were um, they it was really hard for um, a woman from China to come in to Canada to immigrate. So most of the men um, were coming over and leaving mm -hmm. their wife and families behind. Right. So right. like you said, unless they were mailing their clothes home back to China, you know, to be washed, um, there was, you know, going to be a need to have a laundry, um, you know, for them to go, mm -hmm. And then in the case of Sam, you know, to open up a business and um, be able to support himself while he was here. So, well, yeah. And, you know, and they, uh, Toronto had laws about it. They were only allowed to do certain professions. So, you know, they were like, well, because you're Chinese, you can pick one of these things and that's it. You know, you can't take these other jobs at all. And, you know, so to limit them on where they may have had some amazing skills elsewhere, you know, maybe right. they were good at carpentry or something mm -hmm. back home. You don't really know. Um, unfortunately, you know, that that was stifled and they were put in a very, very narrow lane on what they can do. Right. Which yeah. just makes it all the more impressive, though, that they thrived. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank, thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> thank and you to I, the volunteers um, for all the information they found out about the seven people. I'm um, going to go find out how I'm all related to them. Because well, I heard there's too. somebody Scottish. So I that's the only thing I know about my family history for sure. So that's what I'm going to go find. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And I know this week too, there was the Ontario Profiles. Well, um, have fun. The, the Ontario profiles are being kind of showcased this week on WikiTree as well because yes. you were bringing right. uh, up um, 
our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Margaret Atwood, the author. Yeah. Um, so I was fiddling around with some of those today to see um, what degree of you know separation <laughs> or connectedness. So the closest one out of those people that were posted today for me was Margaret Atwood. Uh, uh, she was 16 degrees between the two of us. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. So now I'll go back through these seven and see if there's any connections at all. Um, yeah. Just to see. Just to Amazing. see. You never know. Your team is incredible. Your team of volunteers yep. are you phenomenal. You never do, though. Oh, I, I'm just so impressed with all the work you've done. Thank you so much oh, thank for allowing us to be part of this. We're thrilled. Thank you for giving us some great name. Well, it was our pleasure. And mm -hmm. Um, so it was our pleasure. And, you know, we certainly had a lot of fun. Um, it was really yeah. great, you know, working with you guys and being able to put this stuff together. And you definitely have a lot to look through. If you guys have any questions, you can reach out to me or Cheryl and, you know, we can hopefully answer them for you. And um, I think we will go ahead and wrap this up for the night, though. Uh, thank you, everybody that came and watched. It was really a great week. Thank, if you were one of the researchers, a double thank you to you. Uh, and we'll see you for the next one. Hey.